Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nicole Webb, and we really hope the message today blesses you. If you'd like to know more about Liberty Church, please go online to lbcdublin.com. Man, I've never been so excited during the Little Drummer Boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like we need to try to title it Big Drummer Boys. You know what I'm saying? Like Noah's like eight foot three over here. Like, my goodness, that was exciting. I got, I, uh, I sat through the, we sat through the first service, my family and I, but this service, I had to go back in the back and hear that again. Just incredible. Aren't you grateful for our band? Can I hand your hand real quick for this? Wow. As I shared earlier, if this is your first time, I'm so glad you're here. My name is Nate. I'm the, the pastor here. This is uh, your first time. I'd love to fill, for you to fill out a card, which you talked about at the beginning of the service. Um, but getting on to the message, let me start with a, a story of a lady. Some of y'all know this lady. Oprah Winfrey is her name. Whether you agree, disagree with her, that doesn't matter. She's got quite a story, pretty incredible story, actually. Most of you all know her through her TV show, her network, her magazine, her books, her, you get a car, you get a car, all that. Her $2.8 billion net worth, that's a lot of money. I'd love to have a little bit of that. Uh, agree with her or not, she's got an incredible story. Listen to this, which most of y'all don't know this part of the story. I didn't, at least. She was born in 1954 in Mississippi to a single teenage mother. Difficult childhood, faced poverty and abuse. At 18, I'm sorry, excuse me, 14 years old, she was raped and abused by family members and other people in the community. Despite her past, Oprah persevered and focused on her studies. She was awarded a full scholarship to TSU, which is Tennessee State University, studied communication. She became a news anchor in Baltimore, and the rest is history. So pretty humble beginnings, I would call Oprah's story. Like, it's pretty incredible to think about. Well, when Jesus stepped out of heaven to put on humanity and walk on this earth and walk into humble beginnings, even though at the beginning of time when Jesus was there, it wasn't very humble beginnings, but he left tens and thousands of angels bowing at his feet. He left a throne with essentially his name on it to come to this earth in the form of a baby, in the form of a lowly, underprivileged baby. Not on a white horse, as many of the Jews in the first century thought. Not as a ruler, a king, a valiant warrior. He was an underprivileged baby born in a lowly manger. Now with Oprah, her situation, her humble beginnings weren't by choice. She didn't choose the life that was dealt to her. And maybe she was ostracized or abused for who knows what situation and the culture in which she was raised in. But with her upbringing, her poverty, her abuse, she did not, nor would anyone, choose that for anyone. But with Jesus, it was a choice. And he chose to come to this earth in the form of a baby to be born with a beginning that demonstrated extreme humility, and that's humble beginnings that we'll be looking at today and over the next few weeks. Let's pray real quick. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for what you've already done this morning through this incredible church and this church family, and I pray that in this service, in this moment over these next few minutes, that you'll speak to our hearts, that you'll speak to our minds, that we'll put down every wall that we put out put up for something that you want to say to us, that we'll put every distraction aside, that we'll put every notification off for just a moment and hear what you want to say to us. Help us to hear from you, Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Here in a second, we'll be reading out of Luke 1, Luke 1. So humility is a tough thing. It's like if somebody asks you the question, do you consider yourself humble? You can't really answer that question because if you answer yes, you're not very humble. If you answer no, like, I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's like, no, I'm not humble. Why aren't you humble? You should be humble. And it's like, have you ever been around the situation and they like humble brag all the time? You know what I'm saying? Like, gosh, I just, I just had too many people to hang out with. I didn't know who to hang out with. So, or you make up stuff or it's just like, I just got so many friends, I don't know what to do with them. Like, well, you're just trying to be prideful right now. There's no humility to that. Humble, humility can be a difficult thing, but Jesus by choice demonstrated the humility of God as we open up this passage in Luke 1, 26 through 38. Verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by the statement, wondering what kind of greeting this would be. Verse 30, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, 
for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? Verse 35, the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One is to be born. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. Verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Nothing will be impossible with God. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So let me kind of set the stage for what's going on here because it could be kind of confusing. So the Jews are the people of God. They're the people of Israel. The Old Testament is the Jewish people. You don't hear much of Gentiles. You don't hear much of non-Gentiles unless they're at war with them pretty much. And so the Jews in the first century are expecting the Messiah to come on a white horse. They're expecting him to come with a scepter, with a crown. They're expecting him to come down in a completely different way. The future Jewish king, the Messiah that has been prophesied about for at least 1,500 years, they expected him to be of the bloodline of David, which was true. They expected him to save the Jews and deliver Israel from foreign bondage. Well, they never would expect the man that's going to deliver Israel from foreign bondage to be a baby. It just doesn't make sense. Everyone's awaiting the Messiah, the king, and they wouldn't expect a manger. They wouldn't expect shepherds. They wouldn't expect an adolescent teenage girl to be pregnant when she's a virgin. The Jewish people probably sat around for dinner and talked about for centuries, for generations, about when the Messiah is going to come. How is he going to come? Is he going to come to Rome? Is he going to come through a person? Is he going to open the clouds and storm down on a white horse and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess? What will happen? This is the Messiah. What's he going to do? No one expected Jesus to come like he came. Well, if you've known Jesus long enough, if you've had a relationship with God long enough, or maybe you're new to relationship with God, uh, God never shows up the way you'd expect. Amen. We never expect God to show up the way that he shows up. My family never expected three years ago to be in a place called Dublin, Georgia. We'd never heard of Dublin, Georgia. But thank God we followed God's will and not our will because God brought us here for a reason. That's our life. That's our story. We expect God to do, like we, we expect A and God doesn't do B and sometimes even C. He goes all the way to the end and does Z, if you know what I'm saying. Like he never does the first two things that we expect. He launches over all those and does the complete opposite of what we'd expect in our life. And that's our life. And in the Christmas story, God demonstrates humble beginnings through the place. He demonstrates humble beginnings through the per person and through the promise. That's the three points that we're talking about today. So the first one is this. On Christmas night, God demonstrates humility through the place, which is Nazareth. God demonstrates humility through the place. God shows an unexpected place for Jesus' birth. In fact, in John verses 26 of chapter 46 of chapter 1, a man's talking about Nazareth and talking about Jesus, and this is a man's response. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's the kind of place where you'd never expect anyone successful to come from. Let me give you some details about Nazareth. So Nazareth is the place where Jesus was raised, Bethlehem is the place he was born. So Nazareth had a prop population of approximately 400 people. So it's a pretty small town. There wasn't even a Dollar General in Nazareth. If you know, and, and they're in every small town, but there's not even a Dollar General. There might have been a stoplight. There wouldn't have even been a dot for them on the map. They're not mentioned in the Old Testament, so therefore the Jews would not expect anything because everything of worth is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's only about 200 years old, according to researchers. In the Hebrew word, this is pretty neat, the Hebrew word for Nazareth means sprout or a branch. And let me break that down a little bit. Jesus being born in Nazareth, a lowly town, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 11:1, 1, which says this, out of the stump of David's family, that's his bloodline, David's bloodline, King David of the Old Testament, will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. Verse 27 of Luke 1, which you just read, 
to a virgin engaged to a man, for, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. So Nazareth was a branch like Joseph was a branch from the family of David. Now moving on to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. The original meaning of the word Bethlehem in the Hebrew means house of bread. So Bethlehem was called a house of bread. That's the original meaning. Jesus is the bread of life. So you have two cities that were of a lowly nature, nature, especially Nazareth. You have two cities that are fulfilling and exclaiming the prophecy of the Messiah from the beginning of time without anybody even realizing it. So God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, shows very humble beginnings in the place that he was born. So Easterners and Jews, when they read the Bible, typically they'll ask one question when they're reading the Bible. They'll say, what does this mean about God? What does this say about God? A lot of times when we read scripture, we wanna apply it to our own life. It's a good thing. We should, we should be able to apply the light, apply scripture and, and use it for our life. But when they would read scripture, when Easterners or Jew would read scripture, they would read it in the concept of what is this saying about God? Well, there's a lot that we learn about God based on this passage. First of all, is this next fill in the blank. Humility is the key to the Christmas story. Humility is key to the Christmas story. The humility of God, the meekness, the humility, God demonstrates his humility through the place. But God also demonstrates the humility through the person, which is Mother Mary. God demonstrates humility through the person, which is Mary. So maybe they're asking, so maybe they don't think that he's gonna come in on a white horse. We're talking about the Jews. They're like, well, whose womb will carry the Messiah? Like, will he come in the form of a baby? Um, I mean, it's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the second Adam, the son of God, the, the son of Adam or the second Adam, Emmanuel, God with us, the prophesied one, the Messiah. Who's gonna carry this baby? Is it gonna be like a queen? Is it gonna be a, pr a princess? Maybe the most reputable woman in all of the land. I mean, there's this woman, who is it gonna be? She will be an adolescent teenage girl that is a virgin. Well, I can't imagine hearing that. I'd be a little shocked, like, uh, I don't really know if that's the best example because thousands of years we've been waiting for the Messiah. Thousands of years, over 324 individual prophecies about the Messiah. And they're like, a teenage girl? We're trusting a teenage girl? What we gotta understand is that humility was the plan from the beginning and God chose very humble beginnings with his son. He chose a place, an unimportant, unknown place. He chose an unimportant person through an adolescent girl. And if I chose a person to carry the greatest message of all time, one that's gonna divide history, one that's gonna bring the message of truth to all of creation for the rest of time, I'm thinking like maybe a medical professional, maybe a doctor, maybe a police officer, maybe a pastor. I feel like I could share the message. I'm a pretty honest person. Maybe another pastor or something, maybe a politician. Nah, we wouldn't do that. Um, but, but an average teenager today, so think about if an average teenager, teenage girl today was carrying the message of God. Anybody have a teenage girl in their home? Several of y'all do. Some of y'all know a teenage girl. I know several and I've got one in my home. It would probably look a little bit more like this, like, like wow. Like the angel came to me and I got like a baby in my belly, like OMG in my belly, like OMG in my belly. like. OMG, like, oh my goodness, like, let's post a selfie, like morning sickness, oh, I don't feel good, my God's got me, or my baby's got me, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's like, seriously, come on. Not to judge modern day teenage girls, but, but it's real. And some of your parents are like, I've seen you do all those things recently. But something tells me Mary probably didn't sound like a valley girl from the 80s. But it's interesting that he chose a teenage girl. But let me just pause and say this. Church, don't rest on the impact or doubt the impact of teenagers in this generation. Because I've seen it, I'm watching it, and I'll continue to watch God use the teenagers in this church and churches all over this country. Seen it for years, so don't doubt that. And whenever you begin to doubt it, look at scripture. The men and women that God used, typically speaking, they were teenagers before they were much older. They started when they were teenagers. Let me go through a few of those. Moses, Moses Isaac, Rebecca, Esther, Joseph, David. Jeremiah was 17 when he became Israel's prophet. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A boy that provided his lunch wasn't even a teenager. And Mary. So we've got to trust, first of all, that God knows what he's doing. 
And then we've also got to understand that teenagers are capable even today. So Luke 1, 28 through 29, this is what the angel said to Mary. And the angel came to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by the statement, wondering what kind of greeting this would be. So it's taken her off guard. She's like, the Messiah, really, me? And so what you gotta understand, when you read this passage, initially at surface value, you think she's questioning the angel or questioning God. She's not actually. What she's doing is questioning the fact that she can become pregnant because she's never been with a man, which she said in the next verse. And so she did not question God. She questioned that it was capable because she's never been with a, a man. So there's the humility through the place. There's the humility through the person. But here's one thing that the Jews kind of forgot about the heart of God. Now I would say, Mary, it seems like she forgot this too. Because if you go back to the Old Testament in Psalm 138, 6, it says this. Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble. He takes note of the humble. It's not about wealth. It's not about honor. It's not about prestige on this earth because he cares for all people and humility is the key. Quick side note, sometimes honor and wealth and prestige on this earth can often be a deterrent to being used by God. Like Joseph and Mary, they had nothing. It says in several times and indicators through several different stories that they came from essentially nothing, almost poverty. They didn't have much. Well, they didn't have much to lay on the line. And when we have stuff and circumstances and prestige and business and family and this and that, it's hard to lay it on the line because there's a lot that we're risking. When you don't have anything, it, sometimes it can be easier to risk. So sometimes wealth and help, excuse me, honor and wealth and prestige on this earth can be a deterrent to being used by God. God can still use all people, but many times, especially throughout Jesus' birth, he uses the humble. Think about the widow that gave less than a penny in the temple. She gave less than a penny and she was noted in the gospels as giving more than everyone else when she gave less than a penny. People were giving out of excess, giving all kinds of money. She gave less than a penny and God noted that she gave more than everybody. God used the lowly to demonstrate his humility. God used the lowly to demonstrate the humility. And it tells us so much about who God is. He's honorable. He's bigger than any king. He doesn't need a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need a thousand armies to fight his battle. He doesn't need anything to, that we would think that he needs. He doesn't need fill in the blank because he either created or owns them all. And that's who our God is. He chooses the lowly to demonstrate humility. In Isaiah 7, 14, there was a prophecy. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive. The Jews had forgotten that verse, it seems like. The virgin will conceive, have a son, and, the name, and, and name him Emmanuel, excuse me. And then in Luke 2, 7, it says, she wrapped him in cloth and laid him in a manger, in a feeding trough by a barn. He chose to use the hands of a carpenter to craft the wood of a lowly manger for the Messiah to enter this earth. And later in Jesus' life, as you guys know the story pretty well, he chose the hand of another artist, potentially a carpenter as well, to craft from a similar wood, but the wood shaped in the form of a cross. So God entered the earth in ultimate humility and God exited the earth in ultimate humility, being accused of a lowly criminal the person of God could reign and everyone expected that, but he came in the form of a servant. So the third thing is this, God demonstrates humility through the promise. God demonstrates humility through the promise. It says in Isaiah 9, 6, once again, a prophecy, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Luke 1, 32 through 33, which we just read a minute ago. He will be great and be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. When it says here, the house of Jacob, he will rule over the house of Jacob. It's another way of saying the children of Israel. He'll be king of the people of Israel till the end of time. And the ancient people of Israel, the, ancient, the people of today and also Christians, which are the people after the, the Jewish faith when, when Christ came to this earth. The humble servant who was born in a manger was, is, and will stay the king. That's the promise. 
His kingdom will never end through the place, the person, and the promise. That's the example of humble beginnings. It's like what John Newton said. I love the song Amazing Grace, older song, incredible rich lyrics, so much theology throughout, but this is one of the things he says as he's referring to being in heaven for a very long time. He says this, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So John Newton right here is talking about heaven, as I said. Well, Luke, the writer of the book of Luke, Dr. Luke, he's talking about when he was a baby and he's saying he did rule before he came. He rules as a baby and he will rule till the end of the days and forevermore. When we've no less days to sing God praise than when we first begun. So when you began or when you started with the relationship with Jesus, that's when you can continue to sing for the rest of the time because we have no less days than we've ever had. We can continue to sing. The servant, the baby born in a manger will reign forever. And God communicated his humility through this story. So here's one thing about the Jews is they've got a little bit of a gap in their understanding. So they're on one side. Don't worry, I'm not gonna fall. It's a pretty sturdy chair. It'll be all right. Um, None of y'all even laughed. You're not even worried about me. The other services were worried about me, but anyway. Uh, so there's a little bit of a gap. So they're here and God's over there in that chair and there's a separation in their understanding. They miss the mark. There's a gap in their understanding because they thought that God was gonna come as a Messiah and he was gonna come on the white horse and he's gonna reign and conquer Rome. They thought that was gonna be the God of the universe, come in a baby. That's not at all what happened. It was unexpected for them, and they missed the mark. We think, many times we miss the mark as well, because we think, well, I mean, I, I, mean, I know God. Like, I'm, I'm good with God. Like, I got faith. Like, I could take the jump right here. I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to take the jump. But I could take the jump right here, and I, I, could, I could probably make the jump. Like, I'd have to really, but I could make, like, if I just have faith, I'll be good. Faith in what would be the question that I'm trying to ask? But, I mean, when I was a kid, like, I walked an aisle, my parents raised me in church. I've been good enough is really what it comes down to. I've never, I've never like killed anybody. Yeah, I did some stuff a while ago, but, but it's not that big of a deal. What we've got to understand is that's not what God wants either. Because we understand he was a humble servant, but we have to understand God doesn't want somebody good enough. God doesn't want somebody who hasn't done a lot of bad things. God doesn't want somebody that made a decision when they were a kid. God wants somebody that's going to be a fully devoted follower of him. And, and listen to what the, uh, the Paul, Paul, the writer of 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, he wrote this verse and he's a former terrorist. And this is what he's talking about, a life in Christ. Philippians 3.8 says this, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So basically he's saying it's not about heaven, although it is, nothing else matters when we know him. Going on in that, it says, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. Everything, it's nothing in comparison to Jesus. What he's saying in there is, is, is when you have him, you may, you may have nothing physically speaking. You may have no finances, no situation, no job. You may not even have family. But what you have to understand is when you have him and you have nothing of physical value, you have everything. And that's all you need. And it's nothing in comparison to Jesus so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. It's like my friend Casey that came and preached a couple months ago and he told this story. He got saved when he think he was 17 years old and he came home that night after he gave his life to Christ and his dad beat him. And he, and he gets up and he moves on and he says, for the very first time I wasn't alone. So when it comes to physical nature, he had nothing. He really had no family. He had no circumstances. He had no money. He had nothing, but he had everything because he had Jesus. And it was everything to him. And he wants us to understand he is good enough. He is everything. And when we have him, we have everything. So just like the Old Testament Jews, there was a little bit of a disconnect in our understanding as well. They expected God to be one thing and he wasn't. And sometimes we expect God to be, well, I mean, I just, I'm good enough, but it's much more than that because he's talking about how it's everything. It's kind of like this in Romans 3, 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So sin, what is sin? Let me give you an example of sin. How many of y'all have ever told a lie in here? Anybody? Okay, about half of y'all have raised your hand. I appreciate the honesty. The rest of you are lying. And so, so therefore, 
We're all in similar likeness. We've all lied here. So therefore, we're separated from God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're separated. There's a chasm. There's a gap. We miss the mark with somewhere. And we think, well, I mean, I could just like build a bridge. I could take a step of faith and just, and just live by faith, whatever that means. And, and if I just did that, then I'll be good to go. I'll be good enough is what I'll be. But what God's saying there is, is that it's not about being good enough. In fact, there were 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God didn't speak through scripture or speak to the, the people of God. 400 years of silence broken by the cry of a baby on Christmas night. And everything changed. Time was split in two. He stepped out of heaven, clothed in humanity, Emmanuel, God with us. He lived the life that we couldn't live, a perfect life to die the death that we deserved. And when he died that death and the sin that separated us from God, he built a perfect bridge from us to God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And what we've got to understand is that everything starts with Jesus. And when you start with Jesus, you're gonna get it right. Let me tell you a quick story and then we'll be finishing up. Back in 1979, 257 people left New Zealand for a sightseeing flight to Antarctica. Upon departure, there was a two degree error in the flight coordinates. Uh, they thought, I think that's close enough, yet it put them 28 miles off their destination course. The pilots lowered their altitude to give the 257 people a better view. The pilots had years of experience, but they'd never taken this flight before. They had no way of knowing that the incorrect coordinates had placed them directly in the path of Mount Erebus, an active volcano that stands 12,000 feet above the frozen landscape. Sadly, the plane crashed into the side of the volcano, killing all 257 people aboard the plane. It's hard to imagine how this tragedy of ep epic proportions was brought on by a minor error only by a matter of a few degrees. If you're not starting with Jesus, you're living a degree off. And your starting point will determine your destination. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. When you don't start with Jesus, your de destination will always be off. You know, we have to demonstrate humility to understand we need Jesus and we can't do it ourselves. We can't build a, a gap between the, the two. We're separated from God due to our sins, whether it's lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it may be. Those decisions separate us from God, but then God loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And even though we're sinners, Christ filled the gap and he died for us. And if you wanna start with Jesus today, you can do that by surrendering your life to Jesus in just a second. Or maybe you sit there and you say, you know, Nate, I've got it wrong all my life. Then you can start right, right now. Because God loved you so much, enough to send his son to suffer and die for us. And none of us know a love like that apart from Jesus. And if you wanna start with Jesus right now, then you can pray this prayer in the quiet of your own heart. Dear Jesus, I understand I've messed up but you died on the cross for me. You filled the gap. You filled the separation between me and God. I give you my past, my present, my future. I give you my life. Please come into my life and live with me forever. In humility, I make you the King and the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, every head bowed and eye closed. Now, in our first two services, we saw several people give their life to Christ. If right now you just prayed that prayer and you say, I wanna start with Jesus by surrendering my life to him. If that's you, would you do me a favor and slide your hand up in the air until I acknowledge your side of the room? Okay, I see everybody on the left, that's awesome. Anybody in the middle? I got you in the front row, proud of you, man. Anybody in the back? Okay. Anybody over on the right side? Okay, I appreciate the honesty, I see you young lady. Thank you so much, appreciate that, proud of you all. You know what it says in the Bible, it says, uh, it says that when a sinner repents, we even talked about this last week, it says tens and thousands of angels are rejoicing in heaven. This morning we've probably seen a, a dozen, maybe a couple dozen people start with Jesus and repent of their sin and surrender their life 
to Jesus. And so if you raise your hand, I'm so, so proud of you, so excited for you. You're no longer alone. But you got to make the decision to stay on course, to stay close to Jesus. Not because you'll lose him. Not because you lose him, because it says in Scripture in Hebrews, it says he'll never leave us and never forsake us. But because you can stay close to him and stay on his path and keep the right coordinates in the direction that he has for your life. And so right now, here in a second, if you just raise your hand and said, I surrendered my life to Christ, we're gonna, here in a minute, I'm gonna pray, we're gonna stand up, we're gonna sing a little bit more. And if you made that decision, you surrendered your life to Christ, we're gonna have our prayer partners in the, in the back of the room. And if you just go to the back and just talk to one of our prayer partners, they just love to have a conversation with you. You can start out with this, hey, I, I prayed that prayer. Or maybe you don't know what to say and you just wanna walk up to him and just stick a hand of fellowship and a hand of friendship out, that's fine, they'll know what to say. You start a conversation, but don't be scared of getting up and talking to someone in the church about what God did for you. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for humble beginnings. Thank you for your story. Thank you for being unexpected. Thank you for coming in a way that we never saw or imagined or comprehend or understand. But Lord, I just, I pray and I ask, I beg that we can understand who you are understand who the biblical Jesus is and understand that when we surrender everything that we are over to everything that you are, it changes everything because you gave your life. And many of us in here have already given our life to you. And a few people gave their life to you in these moments. So I pray that you give them the courage and the boldness to stand up in a second as we stand up to worship, to go talk to a friend. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.